like a progression. There you go. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Trey Bowles. I'm co-founder and chairman of the DEC Network, formerly the Dallas Entrepreneur Center. Uh, glad that you were able to join us today for another uh, edition of Fridays Are for Founders. We have this once a week on Fridays during lunchtime. Um, trying to help answer questions that entrepreneurs, small business owners have, trying to address some of the issues that we're facing in the in the middle of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and really trying to bring on different entrepreneurs and leaders in the community um, every week that can focus on just a little bit different of a topic, and then create a open forum for you to be able to come in and, and ask questions yourself, and hopefully leave every week with a little bit more prepared, a little bit more equipped um, to come up with the right strategy to move forward so that you not only survive uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but you also thrive as you're coming out the other side of it. So thanks everyone who's here and for being here. Um, we are broadcasting this live and we will, uh, and every week we take this recording, we give it to the Dallas Morning News and they push it out and promote it and, and help give it to a bigger audience as well. So Thank you all for being here. I am super excited this week to have my buddy Carl Dorville on the call with us and um, the opportunity to have him come in. He is a serial entrepreneur, uh, incredible leader, um, brilliant strategist. He just really has a knack for understanding and knowing how to build businesses and make them work. And he's been able to build and equip some pretty amazing teams over the years to help you know manage those businesses and get them to grow. So um, I'm super excited that you're here, Carl. Thanks for being here. Um, happy Friday you. to you. Uh, I want to start out. Regret. I want to start out with uh, going through the process of just letting you tell people uh, what you want them to know about you. Uh, I say every week, I don't really like reading bios. Um, it's embarrassing for the person that you're talking about, especially somebody yeah. like you, because I just go on and on and on and on and <laughs> on. We wouldn't get to any of the, the the meat of the conversation. But would you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and your entrepreneurial background and kind of um, what you've done over the course of your career? Yeah, no. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, both my parents born in Haiti, came to America not knowing how to speak English and really pushed education um, all through life. I uh, went to SMU, graduated with a triple major in public policy, eco-psych. Went back got my MBA, so stayed a little busy in school. Um, after that, started my junior year at SMU, started a tutoring business uh, we'll call it Group Excellence. Uh, it was a great fun. Started with a ten thousand dollar grant from TI, grew it to I think the year we sold the business, we we're doing about fifteen million in sales. Um, sold the business to private equity. Two years later, I was able to buy it back for ten percent of what I sold it for, which was kind of cool. Um, and if you can do that, I recommend it. Uh, but then uh, ended up starting a staffing company um, with the idea that really the tutoring company was really just a staffing company for tutors, and so kind of the expertise was kind of similar to expertise. Uh, grew that from I think. 500,000 to uh, 8.4 million, 8.4 million to 30 million um, through an acquisition that we made. Uh, ended up selling that acquisition to another private private group um, back last October, or sorry, October of 18. Uh, and then a good friend of mine asked me to lead up uh, one of his companies called Dog for Dog. Uh, it's a kind of a Tom Shoes meets dogs. So for every uh, product we sell, we give away something to a local shelter. And that's been a lot of fun. Has some celebrity backing, Snoop Dogg's an investor. So is Michael Buble and some others, uh, which is kind of fun. And I sit on a board of a company called uh, Quad M and they do insurance in the staffing space, kind of another staffing company um, and have been advising them. And they've, they, they had a pretty cool quarter. They grew uh, pretty significantly over the last two quarters. And so, uh, yeah, just really enjoy going from zero to one. Uh, that's kind of my expertise is just from nothing to something. And um, so hopefully I can share anything that provides value to somebody else out there. Wonderful. That's awesome. What a pro what a prolific background. <laughs> Three majors. Was that because you were exceptionally driven or you didn't have any idea what you wanted to do? Uh, well, I had a very clear vision that I wanted to be Matlock. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that would help me go to law school. But no, the public policy and economics uh, kind of fit worked well together. But the psych class, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I had a really cool advisor at SMU and she, I actually was trying to quadruple major, but she, she said, hey, build towers, do one of them at a time. Because if, if you do one of them at a time, then at the end, if you don't uh, end up finishing, at least you have three majors or two majors or one major. But if you do a little bit of all of them and you don't finish, then you have a whole bunch of ruins, uh, which turned out to be a really good uh, business strategy and life philosophy as well. Kind of, you can do a whole bunch of things, but just make sure you do them one at a time. 
And so that's kind of what the approach I took at school and, and it was, it worked out. Absolutely. Well, you said you wanted, you kind of wanted to be Matlock that's and focus on the, on the legal side, but somehow yeah. you, tur you turned into a, a, a tutoring entrepreneur. So can yeah. you take us through how you went from, you know, that one vision or expectation that you had to um, doing something and now doing it serially for years and years and years. Yeah, no. So as I mentioned earlier, parents born in Haiti. And so anybody who has foreign parents know it's really lawyer, doctor, engineer or bust. And so uh, that was I, I picked lawyer because that was kind of the, the line that made sense. But ultimately, I uh, started the two. I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, changed my life, really challenged me to start a business. And in reading that book, really got the idea that, OK, well, what business can I start? I was always loved education. It was pretty good at school. I figured I'd start tutoring kids. And, uh, and that worked. I really I just got lucky that one of my friends, uh, she needed she had a friend who needed a tutor and I ended up tutoring them. And it kind of grew from there. That's amazing. And, and you just kind of saw an opportunity and said, Here's a need I can fulfill it, and and the opportunity continued to exist and grow and grow and grow. So what? Yeah. What stemmed? So you did that, and it worked, mm -hmm. and you and then you bought it back. But but what from there kind of made you think? You know, I mean, because lot, lots of people see needs, lots of people yeah. come up with ideas to, to address problems. Not many people can actually build them and deliver them and do them. But what was it about that that sort of made it into your head that, hey, I think I want to keep doing this and doing this and doing this. And, and my backup follow up question to that is, um, as a result, do you believe uh, entrepreneurs are born or made? Yeah, yeah. So my answer was going to kind of address that. I think there's something in the DNA. Uh, even as I look back, I remember uh, anybody who really went to school and was in band in, uh, in Dallas area would always go to Sandy Lake. Sandy Lake was where, oh, sure. uh, the, yeah, I don't know if you did. So the big competition, Sandy Lakes. And so at the end of Sandy Lake, I remember, uh, everybody would come together for the award ceremony. I, I played saxophone, but everybody would always have extra tickets. And so I remember every year what I would do is I would go around and get everybody's tickets and I would go back to the back of the ticket line because they, people didn't need the tickets anyway. So they gave them to me free, go back to the ticket line while people wait and say, Hey, we're leaving. Will you buy my tickets? And ended up doing that. And I remember the first year we made like twelve dollars. And I mean, we were, I mean, that was huge. Was six, sixth grade making twelve dollars. Great. And the next year we made like five hundred dollars. Um, and it was just it was just it was great. It was just a, a kind of looking back at the experience it kind of showed me that that was always part of my DNA. And when I really looked at I still remember standing uh, being in the library at Fondren and having to make a decision. Um, I was going to take the LSAT the next day. And I kind of had this vision of what was going to happen next. I was going to become a lawyer. I was going to do OK on the LSAT. I was going to go to law school, probably at SMU and stay there kind of all the way through, then become a lawyer, work 80 hours a week, then be a partner, go nine. And I looked at it and I was like, I, I, I don't want to do that. And so I ended up not walking in to go take the LSAT. Um, I just uh, it was funny because I came home. And my dad, my dad and parents, everybody had like these gifts for me. Oh, congratulations. I was like, well, see what happened was and uh, ended, up, <laughs> ended up going down a different path of, of really just pursuing the education thing that was started, because I think that really birthed, it gave me an opportunity to show what was already inside of me. And then once, once it was out there, the idea of going back and doing anything else just never, never, never resonated with me. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that, that, that says a lot to the answer and a, and a lot to the perspective, but but the reality is once you actually get into this process and now you decide, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to build businesses, I'm going to do it. Uh, things don't always work out exactly the way that we, we plan them. And sometimes great things happen, right time, right place. And you sell your company and then it happens great again. You buy the company back for a fraction of the cost. But, but in most cases, especially when you're dealing with smaller businesses or emerging businesses, things don't go as planned. And, mm -hmm. and so when we think about this idea and really the topic for today is about adversity and understanding or adversity is something that every entrepreneur faces, not just, okay. not just you, but, but um, you, you've had such an interesting way of dealing with adversity and looking at it and evaluating it and coming up with a sort of a process that you address. And so I, I'd love to hear about your, your background and, and some of the adversity you faced and then, and then we'll eventually get to how does that apply to COVID-19 world that we're in? Yeah. And would you want uh, business adversity, personal adversity uh, or either or? 
Uh, both, both is fine. Yeah, but, but, but right. def definitely, because I think, especially as an entrepreneur, so much of our personal piece is tied into our business piece because it, mm -hmm. because you you don't get the freedom to, you know, turn your phone off at five o'clock and not ever deal with anything before the next day. But yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, so so I'll go in that order. I'll go personal than business. So on the personal side, um, I I my experience with SMU was great. Um, first year, uh, I had an opportunity to go. Um, I, my dad actually lost his job right before I started. Um, right before I started SMU, and I was actually going to end up going to another southwestern seminar. But when he lost his job, a friend of mine encouraged me to go go back. I didn't realize, though, I didn't realize my mom was actually on her knees praying that I would end up at SMU some kind of way. So I ended up going to SMU. They changed one of my scholarships that was $1,000, went to 12 because they had some financial aid package. And so I was able to go to SMU. That first year cost me 58 cents. And so I kind of took that as a sign. And so I uh, ended up going to SMU, did well that first year. And then my second year, unfortunately, didn't have as many loan, as many scholarships. So I had to go out and take a loan. But the vision was, hey, I'm going to get the presidential scholarship my, going into my junior year and everything will be work great. I'll be able to pay, pay for that. And so for me, um, I got to my sophomore year, took out the loans. I applied for the presidential scholarship. I didn't get it. I applied for uh, another scholarship. It was the Invest in a Black Man Scholarship. And I was like, I'm a black man. They should invest in me. Um, so I figured I was a shoe in But Matt Houston, a good friend of mine, he ended up winning it. And, um, and it really, really went through this. Yeah, really went through this. Um, almost depression just of like what's going on like i think at the time i hadn't made a b at smu so i was like i'm doing everything that i think you're supposed to do but i'm not breaking through and i'm gonna have to leave the school and i remember sitting on the steps of dallas hall and i saw um these trash cans i sat on a committee uh for the bush library and somehow we knew it was coming before we knew but whatever um but i sat on a committee for the bush, bush library and they said the value of every trash can was about sixteen thousand dollars and I counted up, I like all the trash cans I saw just walking down this hall. And I was like, that's my education. And something in me just, just flipped a switch. And I said, no, this isn't okay. And I just believed that I deserved a chance to be here. And I went directly to President Turner's office. I ended up meeting with a guy, President Turner wasn't there, but ended up meeting with a guy named Mike, Mike Novak, who really changed the course of my life and just believed in me and said, hey, you know what, we're gonna give you a shot. And they ended up giving a scholarship that was better than the presidential scholarship. And it, it got me through. And kind of that, that experience kind of always taught me um, more than I even realized at the time that no matter how bad it looks, you can still believe in yourself and kind of find a way to, get, to overcome it. And so taking that now to kind of a, a business adversity uh, back in 08, 08 was a little different uh, for us in the education space in that although the financial climate was really bad, uh, people still had to go to school. That's one, uh, one thing that I really loved about education. But unfortunately, DISD had a very, um, very, uh, they had a budget crisis that year. It really didn't have anything to do with the financial crisis. It was just weird timing. And, but because of the, the budget crisis, we weren't able to start our tutoring. And I remember at the time, I just got, for the first time ever over the summer, I got a deal where a good friend of mine had um, introduced me to somebody and we basically got a line of credit against the business. And the line of credit actually was with the people who ultimately bought the business years later. And so they gave me a line of credit of a million dollars. I had to personally guarantee everything and, and go forward. And we got to the end of the semester. And unfortunately, we hadn't started any of the tutoring. And so we sat there. It was, it was December of 08. I was down $500,000. Um, didn't have any idea how we were going to get this money back, what we were going to do. And um, yeah, just again, a lot of sleepless nights. But that experience kind of that I, I built on of of what happened during school was I was like, well, this, this is bad, but I think we can get through it. And ultimately the vision, we ended up expanding to Fort Worth. And really I told the investors, I know we can do this. I just need a little bit more money, which was kind of a scary ask when you're already down to ask for a little bit more, but I asked for more. Uh, they increased the line up to 1.5. I told them my vision, we're going to go to Fort Worth and grow the business. And ultimately by April, we had drawn, I think it was $1.2 million on the $1.5 million loan. And DISD owed us this money. I think they owed us about 700, uh, well, I guess DISD itself owed us 700,000. I think the other groups made up the other 500. And it was tough because it didn't look like they were gonna pay anytime soon, but we had done the work. And again, uh, going back on the experience I had with SMU, I literally went up to DISD every single day and 
just over and over again said, this isn't right. We're helping kids. You have to help us. There's, there's, we are, we deserve of this money and just knock on all the doors, ended up going all the way up to the CFO's office and finally kind of was able to break through and they were able to fund us. And we were able to, by June, paid the line completely down, uh, made an incredible friend, which is why he, he was willing to buy the business because he kind of saw what happened. And so I was just really a just cash flow issue. And again, that experience grew me up a lot. Uh, it was it was a great experience uh, now looking back, but it was really tough uh, during the time. Those yeah. So, so those, oh, those, yeah, those are two uh, examples. Of a good entrepreneur is one, courage, because it takes a lot of courage to go out and try to do something like that. Two, persistence and stick to mm -hmm. the, the idea that, you know, we're constantly trying to figure out I think we're, did we just go offline and then back online? We're, we're back on. Yeah. We might have dipped out for. Sorry like guys. So seconds. what I was saying was the, the three, um, the three components of an entrepreneur that I like the most, the first is courage. Um, because it takes a lot of guts to, to go out and try to start something and, and to, and to take that leap of faith and to see, to give a chance to, to make your business work. Second, and what Carl was just talking about was persistence. The idea of just the stick-to-itiveness, not giving up and just going and going and going and, and recognizing that in the end, especially when you're dealing with an early stage business, the only way it's going to work is, is on you. Um, and mm -hmm. so doing that and constantly going back up to DISD and, and, and pursuing and pursuing and pursuing is just an incredible thing. And then I think the third element of what makes entrepreneurs great is a, there's a, a little bit of crazy in us. The fact mm -hmm. that you have to be crazy to have the courage to go try something that most people that try fail and the persistence to keep with it, even when everybody else doesn't think it's going to happen. And so those three components Absolutely. are a big one. And so I, so I appreciate that, that, that response to adversity being a, a pers persistent focus. Um, Delaney, I'll let you ask a question. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. It's always good um, context and uh, additional add-ons. Um, but as Trey was saying, you know, the conversation today is adversity. Um, that is, I think, a, ex, the exact example, you know, of uh, just continuing with that persistence. But I mean, you've started many businesses and there's um, multiple opportunities where you I'm sure you've faced struggles. And um, as you have multiple, I'm sure there's um, some situations where you've had similar um, similar troubles, you know, in that process of starting all these businesses, have you seen any um, similar issues that you can expect to face um, when you're starting a new business or smart starting a um, or running a small business? Yeah, I think uh, what immediately jumps to mind is the the reality that you're going to make mistakes. Uh, one of the challenges, especially especially people who are, who did really good at school, is there's kind of this built in idea that I have to be a perfectionist. And there's this idea of I want to everything I do, every decision I make has to be perfect and it has to work out. And when it doesn't, uh, there's a tendency to take that personal, um, whereas business business isn't built that way. You're going to take L's. And actually, if you're not failing, you're not actually trying hard enough. And um, and it's uh, to kind of to Trey's point earlier. It's I, I actually used to recommend that everybody be entrepreneurs, but I don't do that anymore because it's that you if you're not wired for this life, it's not something you should pursue. Just take your money, put it in the stock market, give it to Tim Cook and, and you'll be fine. Um, like I, I just but if, if this is how you're wired and going back to the idea of of born versus versus made for some of us, it's how we're wired. It's kind of in the fabric of who we are as people. And so you need to go down that path. But one of the things that you learn along the way is if you try to hold fast to this idea of perfectionism, you're going to fail because what's part of some of the hardest adversity to face is, is that mental stability of I just made a bad decision and I have to live. And that decision impacted a lot of people and I have to live with it. So like when we when we grew the business, like when when I sold the business, um, we ended up doing a nationwide expansion on the on the Rebecca side. We were in 35 cities and 13 states. And we ended up getting pretty big, but unfortunately, we didn't get a lot of traction. And and so it just didn't work. And I ultimately had to to let go of of a number of my friends uh, because we just didn't have the funding. We didn't have anything what to do. And I ended up letting go of a lot of people in, I guess, October, November, just in preparation for what was to come. When looking back, I probably should have just waited till the till the till the semester break. And I know that now with hindsight, but I didn't know that at the time. And it was an agonizingly painful decision. And then to know you made the wrong decision and that decision impacted so many people's lives is tough. Um, but there is a bit of, of 
a mental toughness that's developed along the way of knowing I'm going to make mistakes. Unfortunately, uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Um, it's not talked about enough in entrepreneurship. So what we talk a lot about is the excitement and the coolness and, and being on the beach and all the money. But we don't talk about is the loneliness and the absolute pain and struggle of no one understanding what you're going through and what it feels like to be you um, and to feel what it feels like to have that responsibility. And it's been fun coming, having some of my friends uh, taking on different positions of leadership. And as we've kind of got all got older and they come back and say, wow, I didn't know. It's so much easier when you're watching and advising versus when, when you're sitting in the seat. And um, yeah, so, so I think from a, from a, adversity standpoint, that's something that that really has to be built into you. How making sure you're strong enough to overcome those mistakes that you're going to make and recognizing you're going to make mistakes. Um, it's just part of the process. Well, and I think this as an interesting side note, as I look back <clears throat> at my career and some of the the pinnacle companies and teams that were put together that that ended up building something and being at the right place at the right time and then all going off and doing really cool st additional things. Um, it's the case. I, looking at the team that you had, um, I'd love for you to just, if you, if you will, to whatever degree you are, let let us know yeah. who, who some of those people are and what those people are doing today, yeah. because it's outstanding what kind of team that you guys amassed at Group Excellence and and the impact that those individuals are having now in in communities and culture and in the business world and nonprofit sector is actually really incredible. So that's not a part of the questions, but yeah. I, I just wanted to take a chance to well, talk about that. Well, yeah, so jumping in. So Byron is actually who I was talking about just now. Uh, Byron Sanders, good friend. We, we actually had that conversation, I guess it was three weeks ago. Uh, he's CEO of Big Thought Now. And, and we just had a conversation about, hey, um, or yeah, he, he came and said, hey, it's a lot different when you have to make the decision. Like it's just it's that subtle shift of it's completely your call. It's completely different. And it's um, it was it was I was happy to have that conversation with him. And and like you said, as we keep going, I'll go ahead and share some of these people's names because I don't think anybody will care. So um, but we'll definitely keep doing that. Great. Yeah, they um, do care. They can get over. <laughs> well, our, our, our very own Michelle Williams was a part of it. was a yeah. part of the team group excellence. Oh. And she now heads yeah. up the all of the Southern Dallas Entrepreneur Network and um, and is is on the board of, of the DEC Network. And it's just been such for the last three, three or four years have been has been such a important leader um, and um, value creator for the DEC and, and what we're able to do for entrepreneurs that she's she's just an, another, you know, of the many examples you have of people who are out there just crushing it today. So absolutely. Sorry, Delaney, back on back. On <laughs> No, you're good. That's a good conversation. Um, we've talked a little bit about personal and business. So I do want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit uh, more on the personal side. You know, you talk about how yeah. as an entrepreneur, it is so lonely and it is this um, it can be this uh, you make the wrong decision and you're like, wow, I made this wrong decision. And it's affecting so many people and a mental toughness of getting through it. How can a new entrepreneur who has maybe gone through their first or second time of realizing I've made this wrong decision? I feel awful. How do you recommend that they, you know, get through that? Yeah, I think a couple of different things. Uh, first and foremost, the the self awareness uh, of using that opportunity to see should I be an entrepreneur? Because uh, first and foremost, you may that may not be the pathway for you. It may be better for you to go get a job and work somewhere and be an entrepreneur where you have developed ideas in different spaces, and you can still maintain an entrepreneurial mindset. And what I mean, what I mean kind of directly with that is you can treat where the company you work with as your first and biggest client, as opposed to your job. And I think with that mindset, you know, you have a steady income and you can still work on some other things. But using the opportunity to have self-awareness about who and what you are, I think, is, is first and foremost. I think second to that, um, having a group of people around you who are willing to tell you the truth. Um, I call them a personal board of directors a group of three to five people that uh, you know you can talk to. And, and every one of us have it. Uh, if you're going to move to California next week, there's three or five people that you go talk to about that decision. Well, those people are your personal board of directors. And unfortunately, what happens is a lot of us allow that to happen on accident when we really should do it on purpose. We should really decide who these people are and be able to leverage that resource when the time calls for it. And so when you're in those low moments, you really can lean on to those people as um, as advice centers. Uh, for for you to kind of get through this where they can just be honest about, hey, yeah, you made a bad decision, but here's what you can do to get over it. Or but that doesn't mean you're a bad leader. It's, it's having that support system. I think it's the, the only 
only way to really get get the rest of the way there. And they will they have the ability to act add some objectivity to it. Uh, using another example for me, like we we're going through a really tough time with the staffing business in terms of some of the stuff that we were going through, and just mentally it was really tough. And we had a family trip that was coming up, and and I was like, well, I can't even go. I got to really focus on this. And my mentor at the time sat me down and said, why? He's like, this with the family. Because going on a trip, these, these lifelong memories were made. This would have been a huge mistake not to go. Um, but I didn't know at the time. And so having that group of people around you who can be objective about your failure um, is, is really important, I think. That's great. Um, well, then in that case, we'll kind of um, we'll also take a step back and go um, kind of back into adversity. But also we've talked about it at large, but um, especially at this time, I mean, more than any yeah. time. Um, sorry if you all hear nails in the background. My um, apartment, I live in an apartment and they're doing construction right. next door. There you go. But um, yes, but um, adversity in COVID, you know, like how how are you approaching it? You've definitely um, yeah. you've definitely faced adversity, whether it be in your normal business, 2008. And now we're in a completely different situation. How have yeah. you approached COVID and then what have you been doing to face this adversity? Yeah, like first and foremost, I think that self-awareness of where we are in the world is really important. And this belief that carnage is not going to happen is silly. There's going to be absolute carnage. And it, if you don't allow yourself to live that truth, you can't objectively um, uh, get over it because you're still believing, well, it's going to come back or it's going to be new. But this was, um, um, I've, I said it to a friend the other day, the past is in a revolutionary war with the future and the future just gave the path a death blow. Like this, this is forever going to change the way, even what we're doing right now, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have been doing um, just a few months ago. But technology is, is going to change who and what we are and adapting to those spaces, I think, makes sense. And taking a really ass realistic assessment of can my business survive in this new world? And if it can, then how do I need to change to go forward? And if it can't, stop and go do something else. Um, I didn't, so on the personal front, like that's one of the things I tell my kids pretty consistently is the world changed. This is a completely different world. The world you lived in no longer exists. And this is a new world. And and because I think it's really important that we recognize that truth, um, but but then then again, retool for this new world based on the reality. But there's a lot of people that are that are believing that the business that they have is still going to exist. But if you think people are really going to go back and to have retail businesses after this, it's not going to be the same. It can't. It doesn't make any sense. And people realize what the younger generation has known for a while, which is. Technology has made things easier and you can do stuff from home. I don't have to go to a building to be as effective. And I think the, now the, 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 the powers that be have realized that not only is that true, but it's actually cheaper. And so I just don't think that the world's going to go back to where it was. Definitely. And um, in that case, you know, you talk about that this has, you know, changed every business. Um, how, how is it changing yours and how is your team pivoting yeah. and, you know, shifting in this new world that, like you said, has completely just been a death sentence to the old world? Yeah. So, so I'll speak uh, in terms of uh, two worlds. So in terms of uh, the dog for dog, uh, it's forced a change that we were going to do anyway. Uh, I, I really thought it made sense for us to go online and start selling direct to consumer. We, we hadn't been doing that. We'd been really re retail based. Um, and so this created an opportunity where luckily some of the work we did putting in fulfillment and doing stuff, we're now in a position to take full advantage of. Uh, but it's also create for us specifically at that business, it also created a unique opportunity for partnership. So some of our affiliates who were actually delivering to the retailers, we were able to have some conversations about, hey, does it make sense for us to now come together and be one unit and maybe create a joint venture to go grow the business? Whereas before that wouldn't have made sense. Uh, now it makes perfect sense. And so those new parts. Did we, did we lose him a little bit? I think we might have lost him slightly. We can all practice the freeze. <laughs> the, was, the, the, perks a, of, the 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 uh, perks of the perks of from home. That, that, that was, was a total. Right. It's a total dad joke, wasn't it? 
<laughs> just doing this. <laughs> Sorry, we lost you, Carl, for a minute. Um, we'll wait for you to come back on, and we. Kind of All right, it looks like we're back. Okay, oh, yeah. good. you're good. I, yeah, I can. Yeah, another big pivot on the. Oh. All right. Sorry. We're back we're, yeah, we're we're okay, we're no, back. We just we lost you for a minute, so you were kind of in the middle of. Uh, of oh no! Theater. I'm just saying that. Um, where the pivot to online is kind of where we are now in the world. Yeah. Um, do you think in that case there's any businesses, you know, you said that this is just a completely new world, which I agree. Um, do you think that there are any businesses that can just keep doing the same thing? Um, what's your view on the different industries? Or do you think that this is just new for everyone and that everybody really has to pivot? Otherwise, you're not going to sustain this. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I think construction is probably about the same as what it was. Uh, you're going to obviously have to put, take some precautions and uh, wear masks and whatnot. I think there'll be a demand shift just, just in general, just with people not needing as much uh, re commercial space. Uh, but in general, in terms of how they do their day to day job, that probably stays about the same. Uh, but other than that, I can't I can't think of off the top of my head of anything else that won't be dramatically impacted. Um, yeah. And again, that's necessarily a bad thing. It just, it, but from a from a reality standpoint, there was this older generation that was scared of technology and wasn't going to let it take over. Well, that changed. Um, <laughs> and again, it's happened before and it's going to happen even more. I never dreamed when I first got my phone, I never dreamed of the day where my mom would text me. Uh, that seemed crazy. She's never going to text. But now that's that's a normal thing. It's actually unnormal to think that wouldn't happen. But um zoom calls people who would never in a million years would have been on a zoom call are doing it now because they have to and so some of those things are going to be positive and create new industries uh so try to look kind of glass half uh, half full whenever you can yeah definitely on that note um you know what new opportunities do you think that this creates for businesses um you know I, I personally think, and not to interject, but I do think that many people can address this as either, you know, um, oh man, this mm -hmm. really stinks, I'm, I'm closing the doors, or people can look at it as an opportunity. You know, how, how can people do that? What opportunities are out there? What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think uh, I'll start with industry-wide and specific. So industry-wide, I think obviously technology is gonna benefit. I really think healthcare and education is gonna benefit quite a bit as well. Uh, with the leveraging of technology, obviously with telemed, tele, televet, tele, uh, tele anything. I think those opportunities exist and changes that probably should have been made a long time ago. Even again, in the pet space, uh, televeterinarians should have been possible before, but there's some laws that kept that from being able to happen. And same with telemedicine, it really hadn't taken, um, and the world hadn't taken full advantage of what that could mean. And I think we're starting to now. Um, in education, obviously, uh, kind of where the background came from, this is this is the single greatest opportunity for education I think we've ever had, um, because I've always believed there was no excuse for a kid to get a bad lecture. We have too many great teachers, and we have the opportunity to record them and let them hear it. And now, for the first time, that's going to happen, and creating a business model that allows teachers to be able to go work with students and then be paid kind of on a per month, per monthly basis or some some new way of paying them that the best teachers in the world are able to get paid the most, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not more, because they're providing great value to uh, to to kids. I think opportunities for that are going to kind of emerge. Well, uh, then on the personal front, being stuck at home for so long really does something to your psyche. And I think entrepreneurs, because of that loneliness that's built into who and what we are and what we have to do, are probably better equipped than most to get through this. And so taking the time to really recognize that this is an opportunity where everybody took a pause when you're positioned to grow uh, could make a lot of sense. Definitely. Trey, did you have a comment? No, I, well, I was just going to say, in, in addition to what you're saying about the teachers, because um, we, we have been trained to teach and learn the same way for hundreds of years. This gives us the opportunity to recognize, forces us to recognize that people learn differently. Some people are audible learners, some people are visual learners, some people, you know, go at different speeds. And so I, I'm 100% agree with you that education is a huge um, opportunity to expand and grow and refine and, you know, uh, re innovate in as we move forward. I think that makes sense. And, and your point about entrepreneurs being better equipped 
to handle this. I think that's a really astute perspective because um, I've watched people around me and and friends and people really struggle with some of this. And I'm I'm sitting here going, I don't. It doesn't matter whether I'm in a building or in a closet or wherever. I'm going to walk in there, and 16 hours later, I'm going to walk out and not real. I, maybe I ate. Maybe I went to the restroom. I don't know. But that it's just those details don't yeah. really filter in on the entrepreneurial spectrum near as much. But, um, but I do think there is lots of opportunity here for people that are, um, you know, forward thinking and people that are looking for opportunities, people that understand consumer behavior and the way that people are responding because people also want to be led too. And so there's a lot of things that we're feeling that we don't know how to deal with. And there's a lot of opportunities yeah. that come out of this. And that's where, I, that's where I think, um, you know, uh, the creativity is or, or um, necessity is the mother of invention. And so I think we're going to continue to see more and more people come out with stuff and, and there'll be a lot of crap, but, but I think there'll be some good stuff too. So I, I just, I appreciated your perspective on that. Delaney. Yeah. Um, yeah there's, a, there's obviously a lot of opportunity, but there's also um, a lot of uncertainty. I mean, every single day changes, it's always evolving. Um, mm -hmm. How do you evaluate your business in a time of so much uncertainty and potential risk? And how do you even start to make decisions when, you know, the next week isn't even um, predictable? Yeah, and 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 I think just adding on to that, manage teams and people. And I think first yeah. and foremost, it starts with your mission. Uh, because yeah, a great mission statement uh, answers the question of why am I here. And if you have that great guiding light, it really starts. Even even if COVID happens, even if the world changes, um, you still know. Well, this is what we're here. This is our mission. This is what we're here. This is what we're trying to do. No matter what, no matter what above anything. And so your mission doesn't change. But your approach, um, that does change. It, it can be flexible. It has to be flexible. And I think one of the ways that you assess is just kind of uh, uh, one of the values I typically have in any business I run is do, a, do what's best for the client. And so just asking yourself that question in these times is, OK, based on where we are right now, what's best for the client? And let that be your guiding light. And you do. You're not going to have certainty. And I think at least as it relates to managing teams, being really honest about that truth because everybody already knows. One of the things that we sometimes do as leaders and, and people are starting something new, we wanna hold it on our own and we wanna carry it by ourselves because we think no one will notice. When everybody already sees you're going through it, why lie about it? And more importantly, why not share it with some people that can actually bring value? Again, you gotta be smart about it. And going back to that board of directors idea, not everybody should be and, and can be on your board of directors because their perspective won't be helpful, but you're looking for advice of others, really spending time with yourself and really analyzing, OK, based on where we are right now and based on where I'm trying to go, knowing what I know, what would I do different and start making those steps and going back to really the first thing that we said, being comfortable with the idea that you're going to make mistakes and don't judge yourself about the mistakes. Judge yourself by your ability to uh, respond back uh, as quickly as possible. Well, that's, that's such adjust. a cool well, it's such a cool point because the thing I always often tell entrepreneurs is the greatest thing about being an entrepreneur is we don't have the luxury of being right or about everything or caring that we don't know how to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs are the ones that say, I don't know what that that word means that you just said. We're, we, we, because everything that we don't know costs us time and costs us money. Yeah, We don't have time or, or, or enough money to sit around and act like we know something that we don't know how to do. And so being, that's a very freeing feeling, but also recognizing all the time that the worst thing that somebody can do if you ask a question that they think is stupid is that they can look at you that you're stupid, but you're just trying to get the information. And ignorance is not a character yeah. flaw, right? Lack of, lack of knowledge is not a yeah. character flaw. And so I, I think if if there there are certain things I think that people could learn from entrepreneurs' skill sets and things that they do, that's one of them. I think the there are also some negatives yep. about being an entrepreneur that people shouldn't take with them, but uh, but that that's an important one. Just re recognizing the need to be able to do that, the opportunity to be able to do that, and now is as good a time as ever to 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 really learn and grow and and refine yourself. And 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 as you've said several times on the call today, uh, you know self-actualize and self-prescribe and understand and take mm -hmm. a look of your, the understanding you have of yourself, your abilities and the things that you can accomplish so that you build the best possible strategy and team to move forward. 
Um, you referenced it yeah, a little no, bit. And, and, oh, uh, go ahead, Carl. Yeah. No, you can go ahead. Um, I was just saying you had referenced it a little bit, but managing teams and, you know, being a good leader. Um, but I did want to take some time to directly address, you know, how how are you, you know, how can someone be a good leader to their team when they're facing adversity as well? Their team is, everybody's in uncharted waters. Um, we're, we're back in the place. Nobody, everybody's in the same place. If nobody knows what they're doing to a certain extent, um, you know, how, how can you be a good leader and lead your team in the way um, that is best for them and best for your organization, even when going through this time? Yeah, I think I think it starts first and foremost with not believing that you have to be an expert, the expert to lead. Uh, your job as the leader, I think first and foremost, is to make sure everybody's on the same page as to why we're here. And once you establish that as the truth, um, then you kind of keep moving forward. So, uh, using t more concrete examples, like for I remember going back to the first example I gave of kind of adversity when we we're down five hundred thousand. Um, for us, like the the focus, I said, hey. Our mission is motivating, inspiring students to achieve excellence. Like that's our mission. That's why we're here. This is what we're doing. Um, that said, um, it's better for the students who in that terms was our clients for us to be alive than not alive. And because that's true, we're going to have to let people go and it's not going to be fun. I'm not going to enjoy it, but we have to do it in order to keep the company healthy and grow. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs right now who are struggling and they're taking food out of their mouth to give to their people or more importantly, they're just going through a tough time and they know they have two incredible people, but they can only keep one and they don't know what to do. And the best that they can do is maybe identify some objective standard as to which uh, to choose, but it's not, it's gonna hurt one or another. But again, heavy is the head that wears a crown. That's what you're signing up for. You're signing up for those difficult decisions. You're signing up for those hard times. And again, it's why I don't recommend that people do this because it, it takes a toll on you both physically and mentally but it is necessary. And I think probably the thing, again, that people don't talk about a lot is that even though you're going to make mistakes and even when you get comfortable, that's going to happen, people are going to talk about you and people are going to talk bad about you and people are going to lie about you, They're going to lie about the situation because all they know is what they experience. And again, I had a great uh, a mentor that said one time, if, if you give your uh, if I gave my daughter uh, a piece of paper and told her to draw a picture of me, she'd draw a probably stick figure with a circle and some, uh, but it really wouldn't look anything like me. But from her perspective, it would be her picture. And he said, would you be angry and upset if the picture looked nothing like you? And I was like, well, no. And he was like, well, why? Well, because that's, that's her perspective, but it's not actually a reflection of who I am. And I think as entrepreneurs, it's really important that we, we don't allow somebody else's picture that they're drawing of you establish who and what you are. Because when you do that, you start falling into this hole of adversity that you can't really get out of because you're fighting your own self. And what they're saying about you is dictating what you feel about yourself when it's just simply not true. Don't let their picture determine who you are uh, because they're gonna talk about you. They're gonna say you should have made a decision, a better decision. You should have done something different, but they've never been in your shoes. And they're gonna lie about what happened, but it's just, again, it's what we signed up for, which is why I don't think anybody should do this. <laughs> That's even um, such a great reminder just for teams and colleagues, you know, especially right now, more than ever, we are seeing, you know, we used to go into the office and see each other and we talk about our pers personal lives to an extent, what you did on the weekend. Now we're getting e like yep. even a, it was already a small sliver and now we're getting an even smaller sliver. And so I think that's a great reminder just for teams and colleagues to remember um, we're only seeing a certain a certain bit of everyone. And, you know, our our perspective is different than the colleague next to me of that person. And it's not even a true, real um, 100 percent, you know, reflection of what it actually is. Um, so I think that's really um, important to keep in mind for everybody during this time. Um, but I did want to talk about um, just as we, you know, start to get towards the end here, whether, um, you know, what are some other, yeah. you know, just general tips, word of advice you can, you know, give to entrepreneurs. You've talked about a lot and some great insights, but just any, you know, others that really stick out to you when going through this and, um, what they can do to thrive and not only survive during this time. Yeah, no, I think a couple different ones that jumped to mind. Number one, as it goes back to kind of that team, um, the, the winning by Jack Welsh is where I kind of got this idea from. But he, he makes an argument in the book that you should always have a list of all your people in order 
of if you had to let one person go, who would it be? And just have that running list so that if something like this happens in adversity, you're not having to make that decision for the first time. You've already thought through it and you've already done it. Um, that said, um, it's the most difficult part about doing that is actually being honest with your people and telling them where they stay on, stand on that list and why. And having a, re a reasonable objective criteria, whether it's, hey, it's trust, team chemistry, results, having some sort of objective criteria and then saying this is where people rank and this is where we, where we go forward and being able to tell people it's not fun, um, especially when things are going good, because then you're all, whoever's at the bottom of the list is like, well, why am I at the bottom? But again, if it's objective, it's helpful because then people, again, people already know. They already know who the worst is. They already know who the best is. So being objective about it is clean. And then when something really bad happens like this or something that changes your business with your focus on your mission, you're able just to go down the list and say, hey, uh, number 876, eight, eight, seven, unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. But they already know it. And the mental trauma of being let go isn't as bad because they already know. And it's and it seems fair to the whole team. Again, very painful, very difficult to do, very easy to say. But if you do it, it prepares you for, for kind of uh, times of difficulty. Um, I think other than that, I would just say that uh, a willingness to look at things in a different way is probably what's necessary now more than ever, because uh, like Trey was saying, I think we as entrepreneurs are best equipped to take advantage of the world and the way that looks. There's going to be uh, we, when we go out 10 years, there's going to be people who became tremendous winners and there's going to be people who became tremendous losers because of what happened right now. And if you look at the time that we have right now as a seed that you're planting towards that future, it's really helpful. And, and I, I find it personally helpful to go out 10 years and reverse engineer, where do I want to be? And so based on where I want to be, that dictates the decisions I make today. And uh, for me personally, I found that really helpful. And uh, even in hard times, you can kind of envision where you want to be and try taking steps to get there. You'll make mistakes, but at least you'll get there. Definitely. Or at least be on the path to get there. Definitely. Um, kind of on that same note, you know, um, what do you think is one thing you've learned during this time that, you know, maybe you wouldn't have learned otherwise that you'll take with you even post pandemic years past now? Yeah. Um, probably that you, you truly have no idea what's going to happen. Um, no matter how much you plan, no matter how much you prepare, there is no guarantees in life. There's no way. I mean, I've, I've seen that happen in business before where people say they're going to come through. They don't or weird things happen. But if you were counting on a deal to happen and all of a sudden COVID, again, there's probably going to be movies and stuff that talk about what happened in this time and you can't predict it. And you think with September 11th happening, you think that you learn your lesson that, oh, no, anything can happen. But again, part, uh, at least some of us, like this is our kind of first real experience of being adults in the real world and actually going through something at this stage. And you just have no idea what's going to happen. And so uh, I think that matters. And probably number two, just relationships, 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 because when things get really hard, like they're getting right now, you start leaning on those relationships and the people who are calling you when they don't have to <laughs> become re readily apparent uh, when everybody's stuck at home all the time. And so taking the time to both invest in people, invest in relationships and um, it's probably, it's probably the thing that those two things are probably the biggest things I'll take away. Definitely. Well, we, uh, we appreciate all that, um, insight trade. Do you have any more, um, any other closing questions or any other thoughts or, um, anything to add? Well, I think, I, I mean, I re want to reiterate some of the themes that I heard today. I think it's important to do that. I think you talked about <laughs> the idea of, of self actualization and really taking a good, understanding and look at yourself and, and who you are, what you can do. I think you talked about um, the idea of being persistence and how persistence is going to work, especially in the face of adversity. Um, they talked about the, you know, the idea of, of recognizing that the world is indeed changing and has changed. And we need to accept that and respond to that and move forward. Um, I, I love the, the approach on, on how do you deal with your teams and that idea of honesty. We had a a speaker uh, a couple of weeks ago talked about the importance of empathy with your customers and just re recognizing that we're all going through this. So I think a lot of what you said today was important. And I think w what I really like and what I was hoping that would come out today and did was this idea of adversity that faces us and has faced you and has faced us in all these different, you know, areas and experiences in building businesses. It's still just 
adversity we're dealing with here. And granted, this is a monumental uh, obstacle that we're having to address, but, but the way that you address all other adversity, the way that you've addressed things in the past are, is the same way in the same structure in the same format at which you need to address these, um, you know, current times. And so my hope is that people recognize that and they can learn from some of what, um, you've, you've learned your experiences and your advice and counsel on how to do that. And I, so I, I appreciate and, that for sure. And, and if I could, can I throw one more thing in there, Trey? Yeah, so so I think Please. the other thing that just jumped out at me when you were you were saying that right now, just get, during those tough times, there's a temp there's a desire as a leader to be completely honest and to be completely transparent. Sometimes there's not an ability to be transparent because things are changing so much. Number one, and because two, timing wise, you just can't be that transparent at that particular time. And I think the value as the leader isn't necessarily transparency, it's authenticity. Like people are gonna have to trust that you're making the best decisions for who, who and what they're doing. And I think we as leaders really have to focus on being authentic. So who we are is who we are. And even especially during tough times, we're not gonna be able to keep everybody in the loop as quickly as possible or every day. But just if they know that you're being authentic and that you're making the best decisions for them and for the business, that's really what they're looking for more than transparency, more than the honesty. It's it's well, not necessarily different than the honesty. The honesty, they always want that. But sometimes it feels dishonest when you're not giving people all the information when really it is. I just can't be as transparent with you because of where you are, because of what we're going through. But I am going to be authentic with you every time. And if I can't tell you, I'm going to say I can't tell you right now or we, we can discuss right. this later. But I really think that that's important. Um, I learned that early on and it really was helpful. Yeah, I, I've seen that, too, in, in my experiences. And one company in particular, we were, uh, I took over as CEO when the company was basically out of money. We had two weeks of cash left. We had to let, I had to let a hundred people go in one day. Um, and what, what we did was what, what I realized and learned that process is yes, people want to be informed. Being informed is important. They don't really want to know all of the stressful things that you're having to deal with. They just want to know the boundaries. And so right. what I, what I was able to do was I, I was able to come in go back to the board, raise a little bit of money and say, look, I know for a fact that you will all have jobs to this day. Now, whether we have jobs past that day or not, I don't know, but I will commit to you that you will have a job to this day. I will also commit to you that we will keep our, our head of HR on and her job for the next two weeks for everybody that got let go is that she's going to help you update your resumes, contact um, recruiting firms. She's going to do all that stuff to help you be able to move forward. And and it's if if you can be, if you can understand what an employee needs to know, what they you know what they what they care about, and don't care about, and you can be you know live up to your word in that. That 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 goes a long long way to building trust, especially when you just let a hundred out of a hundred and ten people leave from from a business. Yeah. And, for something that wasn't their fault at all. You know, it was, it was just, it was, it was mismanagement. So I, I really appreciate that as well. So um, thank you for that. I, I do want to take, before we hang, hang up, I do want to take a couple of minutes and just uh, remind people some resources that are available for entrepreneurs and small business uh, owners out there. Um, I've seen, you've seen me, what I put up there already, which is come check out our one-stop shop for resources. Um, the let's grow North Texas business.com site that gives you access to, um, funding solutions that are available online and virtual events like this one where you can learn and grow and connect based upon what you're looking for, documents, different media components, and really just the hope being that we can pull the best resources from across the ecosystem from hundreds of partners across North Texas and make that available. Um, help so that we can also help connect you to the resources and the resource partners that out there that would be the best fit for what you need. Uh, so, so please make sure you go to that one. Uh, next, uh, we, we've talked about this before, but we have started something uh, during COVID-19 called the Fast Start Mentor Program. That is a free mentor program that will directly connect uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs to a subject matter expert, an experienced entrepreneur, a service provider that could come in and offer really valuable third party support yeah, to help you think through strategically, tactically, you know, for lack of a better example, kind of what Carl was talking about, this idea of a personal board of directors, this isn't necessarily somebody who's going to be with you forever, but it's somebody who's willing to dip in and spend time and um, and resources helping you think through how do you avoid these obstacles? How do you 
how do you deal with the adversities coming your way? Surround yourself with the best, most full team you possibly can and being able to have an expert uh, willing to get, to give up their time um, is, is hugely valuable. Um, and so please, you can go, uh, you can see it there where you should click to, to get access to the Fast Start Mentor Program. I would also encourage people, um, if you think you should be a mentor, you also could be mentored. And so think about the process of, um, if, if you're being mentored, maybe there's somebody you can mentor, but, but look at that, cont that um, continuity that exists between somebody helping you, you helping somebody else that, that really creates a, a positive ecosystem. And lastly, um, we were talking about this a little before we get started. Uh, this week, uh, we uh, announced a partnership between a bunch of great organizations like the Dallas Citizens Council, the Dallas Regional Chamber, the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Dallas Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, North Dallas Chamber, a bunch of groups that have come together to build a fund. Um, where our goal is to create a $5 million fund called uh, the Revive Dallas Small Business Relief Fund. Uh, the goal is to, to create a five, $5 million and make that available for entrepreneurs and small business owners who have less, 15 employees or less, um, less than $1.5 million in annual sales. You have to have seen a 15% drop um, minimum in um, the business in income you've lost directly related to COVID-19. Um, and we are currently accepting pre-applications to that. Um, so you can go to revivedallasfund.com there and, and check that out. We have the site and the applications both in English and Spanish. Um, so just another resource to, to, to be aware of. Uh, and there are lots of, um, there's lots of other resources that are out there that, that, um, that other than what the deck has to offer that we wanna make sure people are able to find where we'll direct you in that direction. Um, Carl, thank you so much for being on the show today and for giving of your time you. and your talents and experience. And um, if anybody wants to find out about your, your website and your dog products, where would they go? Uh, dogfordog.com. There you go. All right. Well, have a great weekend. Be safe. You guys have fun. It's going to be sunny out there. Thanks, Delaney.